Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Blumen. I'm an ambulatory care clinical pharmacist here at Stanford with Primary Care. And today I'm going to do a mini talk on evidence based medication therapies and chronic kidney disease. To outline today's topic, uh, we're going to first start, start talking about the overall kidney health. We'll look at physiology, risk factors for chronic kidney disease, complications of chronic kidney disease, and how we stage CKD. Um, after that, we'll dive into a few of our evidence-based medication therapies. This will include SGLT2 inhibitor, inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, ACEs and ARBs, and statins. Jumping into kidney health. So this is an overview of kidney function. And on the right, you will see a, a diagram of the kidney. The kidney really serves as a filter. And you can see it takes unfiltered blood in and the result will be filtered blood as well as urine. Um, so it's filtering waste, it's filtering out extra water. This is also helpful in how we control our blood pressures, highly integrated in that system. And the kidney is also responsible for making certain hormones. More specifically, there are structures called glomer glomeruli, and these are tiny structures in our kidneys that do the actual filtration. And you can see that picture below of how they appear. And you can see that they're designed to filter out waste and electrolytes and water that we don't need, but they're also designed to keep in things we do need. So waste may be excreted, electrolytes might be excreted, but proteins might stay in the blood and we want them in the blood, red blood cells will stay. Uh, so it acts as a sieve. That's really how that filtration occurs. Now, certain conditions, more most commonly high blood pressure, also known as hypertension, and high blood sugar, for example, and uncontrolled diabetes, that can damage the blood vessels that make up the glomerulus. And that's what causes our filters in our kidneys to be less effective. They can become leaky and they can be scarred. So when you look at this picture on the left, you see a healthy kidney. You will see that you know, blood and products will enter. It will filter out all of our um, uh, waste. And then only blood, clean blood will be left. And the waste will be filtered into the urine. On the right side, the damaged kidney does not really do this efficiently. It's not really filtering out waste and excess fluid. Uh, it also might allow proteins and other things we want to keep to slip into the urine. So it's just not working properly as a result of leakage or scarring, uh, likely due to high blood pressure or high blood sugar. Another way to visualize this is with this picture. And so here you see a normal uh, kidney, healthy kidney. The capillaries keep the proteins and molecules in the blood. And on the right side, you see the damage to those filters. And so it's not only not filtering our waste properly, but it's allowing protein to spill into the urine as a result of damage to those capillary walls in the filter. And the urine can appear darker, can appear foamy. Um, that's one thing we see uh, when we have damaged kidneys. Diabetes and hypertension are leading causes of kidney disease. As we already mentioned, one in three adults with diabetes have kidney disease. Risk factors in diabetes for having chronic kidney disease include sort of uncontrolled sugar, so unmanaged diabetes, uncontrolled high blood pressure, a long duration of diabetes, smoking, weight, history of heart disease, and family history of diabetes or kidney disease. If we enter chronic kidney disease and our kidneys become damaged, the main problem as a result of this can be many fold because the kidneys are so integrated into our physiology. It can cause fluid backup, it can cause our electrolytes to not be at a normal level, it can cause cardiovascular or heart disease, anemia, deficiency in red blood cells, among other issues. When we try to categorize chronic kidney disease, we use what's called staging. And so here you see the staging grid, um, and it's defined by two different values, uh, EGFR and urine albumin creatinine ratio. EGFR is the estimated filtration rate of your kidneys. They're filtering at a high number, that means they're filtering normally. They're filtering at a low number. They're not doing a good job of filtering. There's likely damage. And that's what categorizes you into chronic kidney disease. So depending on how fast your kidneys are filtering, they may be normal 
or they may be in mild or moderate or severe kidney disease. G3A is really the beginning of mild to moderate kid kidney disease where your EGFR falls below 60. From there, you have 3B, stage four, and then stage five is approaching kidney failure and, and stage renal disease. The other thing you will see here is what's called a heat map. So the heat map doesn't determine the stage, but it does tell us something about the risk of progression. And what you will see is the heat map heats up, there's more red, as we go to the right, and that's because it's showing that that's where we have a lot of uh, protein in the urine. Protein can be, go into the urine when our kidneys are damaged, as we saw in some of those pictures before. And what we see is that as there is more protein in the urine, the progression through kidney disease is faster and more likely to occur. And that's what this heat map is trying to show, that if you have stage 3B with no protein in the urine, you're less likely to progress through kidney disease than if you had a lot of protein in the urine. So this leads us onto our medication, right? This gives us a background to understand why we use specific medication in chronic kidney disease. The first medicine we'll talk about today is called an SGLT2 inhibitor. That's the class of medicine. There are several medicines that fall within the class. These medications work by blocking glucose reabsorption in the kidneys, so blocking sugar reabsorption in the kidneys uh, by blocking a certain enzyme. So initially, as you can imagine, this mechanism was uh, captured for blood sugar control. And so we see that it can help excrete excess glucose uh, through the urine, and that lowers blood sugar. Uh, it also, you know, the, the sugar comes with some water, so you get a little bit of water weight loss and potentially some dehydration. Um, and as a result of also losing water, you can see a little bit of blood pressure lowering. What we came to understand is not only was it helpful for diabetes, but also it was helpful for the kidneys. Initially, we saw this for people with chronic kidney disease with diabetes, and then we saw it with and without diabetes. And the reason it does this is it reduces inflammation and scarring in the kidney tissue and it reduces the pressure and workload on those filters in the kidneys. And when the pressure and workload in the kidneys is decreased, the protein that's leaking into the urine is also decreased, which is a, a good marker to assess you know, progression through kidney disease, as we just saw on the heat map. So the two most common medications uh, we use in this class are Jardiance and Farsiga. Jardiance to start, um, there was a trial, it's called the Empa Kidney Trial, and it was a randomized parallel group, double-blind placebo-controlled trial, just to say that it, it was highly controlled, the best way to get data. And it looked at patients, a lot of patients, um, with either sort of more severe CKD or milder CKD with protein in the urine on a two-year average follow-up. And what we saw was a statistically significant, significantly less progression of kidney disease or death from cardiovascular disease in people that took the Jardians versus placebo. And the reduction in rate of hospitalizations was also seen in that Jardians group versus placebo. And this uh, result was consistent both with, for people with and without diabetes. And to put a finer point on it, you can sort of visually see here this graph shows placebo in gray versus Jardiance in sort of orange and showing the difference and the less likelihood of having a cardiovascular or chronic kidney disease event. So the Jardiance group was 28% less likely to experience progression of kidney disease or death from cardiovascular causes and 14% less likely to be hospitalized. On the right, you will see a picture of the filtration rate of placebo versus Jardians, and you can see that at that end mark, the Jardians group has a higher filtration rate, meaning healthier kidneys than placebo. Initially, it decreases because it reduces that pressure and workload, which technically reduces the EGFR. You have a slight sort of falsely elevated EGFR sometimes in uncontrolled kidney disease. But over the long time, over the long run, the Jardians group has better kidney function. The other medication I mentioned, Farsiga, that's in this class, had a DAPA CKD trial. Again, highly controlled um, clinical trial with many patients with a similar sort of inclusion criteria of people with CKD and uh, urine uh, protein in the urine, so albuminuria. 
This follow-up was about 2.4 uh, years and showed a reduction in the composite score of several different kidney markers, essentially showing significantly less uh, progression through chronic kidney disease in the Farsiga group versus placebo. And again, this was consistent for people with and without diabetes, and the rate of serious uh, events, adverse events, so serious side effects, was similar in the placebo versus the Farsiga group. To see it a little bit more visually, you can see very similar graphs to what we saw with Jardians. The likelihood of uh, having one of these outcomes of chronic kidney disease is much lower in the Farsiga group. You see it here in blue versus um, the red placebo group. And at the end of the trial, similarly, the curve shows higher um, filtration rate for uh, the uh, Farsiga group. And what we saw is essentially the first year group had 39% less likely, uh, less likelihood to experience one of these outcomes that we um, categorize as progression of chronic kidney disease. And if only 19 people were treated with Farsiga, we would prevent one of these events from happening. So that's a pretty powerful effect. As a result of this data, you will see them in multiple guidelines. So the Cadigo guidelines is the chronic kidney disease guidelines we use to manage um, and treat chronic kidney disease. And you'll see here that SGLT2 inhibitors are one of the recommendations. You will also see it in diabetes guidelines for people with diabetes and CKD. It's the essentially first line medication. Another class of medication we use is the GLP-1 receptor agonists. These are very popular these days in, in uh, sort of pop culture for a number of different things that they do. Um, initially, these were founded as diabetes medications that use this receptor uh, to mimic a naturally occurring hormone, the GLP-1, and which stimulates insulin secretion, and which lowers sugar. Uh, it also slows gastric emptying, which causes appetite suppression, and it promotes satiety, which also increases the fullness. As a result, the main effects of this medicine are lower sugar and weight loss, which is why they are so popular. Um, what we also came to see, though, especially recently, new, new studies within this year have shown that not only does it do those things, but it also can help improve chronic kidney disease in people with diabetes. And so they ran this trial called the FLOW trial, where they had, again, thousands of people with diabetes and CKD. So they had to have diabetes to be in the trial, and they had some level of CKD, and it showed a significantly reduced risk of major kidney disease, this composite score, of progression of kidney disease when they compared it against placebo. And interestingly, the serious side effects were less in the Ozempic group versus placebo. And so this is a more visualization of what we saw. The Ozempic group had 18%, 18.7% had a major kidney disease event versus placebo had 23%. So Ozempic was 24% less likely to have one of these events versus placebo. Um, and you can see the filtration rate of the kidneys. The progression was much slower when you compare it to placebo. As a result of this, GLP-1s are recognized in diabetes guidelines as an alternative choice uh, if you can't get an SGLT2 inhibitor or it's just better suited for you in terms of both treating diabetes but also uh, managing chronic kidney disease and preventing progression. The third class of medication is called the ACE and, ACEs and ARBs. This is two different medicines, but they work on the same pathway. These are old blood pressure medicines that have been around for a long time. Um, the angiotensin converting enzyme ACE, uh, so the ACE inhibitors, and the angiotensin receptor blockers, those are the ARBs. Um, we use them initially in blood pressure, but what we came to see is that they also reduce protein in the urine and they slow the decline of your filtration rate when you have kidney disease. And this was seen in several different trials. Um, and as a result of this, the CADIGO, the main chronic kidney disease medical guidelines, have multiple recommendations for these types of medicines. They, both, they say, you know, in people with CKD and severe protein in the urine, you know, over 300, Without diabetes, this is what we should be using to help slow down that protein in the urine and slow down the progression of chronic kidney disease. In people with moderately increased albuminuria, even without diabetes, 
this is still something we should be using because it will slow the progression of chronic kidney disease. Now, of course, in people with CKD and increased protein in the urine with diabetes, it does the same thing. Um, and so this has a lot of use cases in helping preserve our kidneys. It can treat the high blood pressure. Uh, it can preserve the kidneys both in and outside of diabetes. And whether or not you have very severely elevated uh, protein in the urine or mildly elevated protein in the urine, it's still found to be helpful. The last class of medication we'll discuss are the statins. Um, these are also known as HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. These are initially sort of founded as cholesterol medication. Lipitor may be a common medicine people uh, associate with the class or Crestor. What we have to understand is individuals with CKD have two to four times higher risk of heart disease compared to the general population, which is why we're talking about a heart medicine during chronic kidney disease topics. Not only do statins lower you know, bad cholesterol and increase good cholesterol, which of course has a direct correlation with our heart health, independently of that, they also show that statins can reduce the risk of cardiovascular events even if your cholesterol is good and at goal. And because we know the CKD population has a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, there were several trials ran to see, will it reduce cardiovascular risk in this population that we know has a higher risk to begin with? That was, this is one of them, the SHARP trial, and it randomized people against placebo versus ezetimibe with simvastatin, so a, a double combination cholesterol medication. And the average LDL in this group was 100, which is not very high. It may be above some goals based on your medical history, but this is not sky high. And so it, it still proved that even in this you know, very large group that didn't have a massively elevated bad cholesterol, the group that was getting the medicine was still 17% less likely to have a major cardiovascular event, which is usually characterized as heart attack, stroke, or cardiovascular death. And you can see that visually here in the red line being placebo, the blue line being simvastatin, and you can see that it, there were less events in the uh, population versus the placebo group. As a result of that, statins are, again, published in the Cadigo guidelines and essentially say that anybody with chronic kidney disease should consider a statin or a statin azetamide combination because we know even if their cholesterol is at goal, this will prevent someone from having heart attack, stroke, or other cardiovascular conditions that can lead to something fatal. And so you can see several of their uh, recommendations here for people with elevated, uh, you know, more severe CKD, milder CKD, but in, in any case, it is recommended. And if you look at the diabetes guidelines, similarly, it shows that people, even with a good LDL, should be taking a statin because we know that if you have an increased cardiovascular risk, this will decrease it. With that said, I hope uh, this was able to provide you a brief overview on some of the medications we use in chronic kidney disease and some background on chronic kidney disease. I appreciate everyone for listening. Thank you so much.